it's that holiday time filled of the year, especially for a lot of the people viewing in Europe and the United States, and that means that we're going to be talking about deer, but not reindeer, or actually technically not even any kind of deer, because from what we know, Xenocaryx amidale isn't actually a deer, it is just in the same group as them being the artiodactyls. And the thing is, it has some relatives around today that are even closer to it. So let's look into how Xenocaryx would have been living in its environment, and also kind of just what else it was related to. Now, the group that includes Xenocaryx, the artiodactyls, are incredibly, incredibly successful. We know them from many different groups that are still around today. You have giraffes, and camels, and pigs, and deer, and whales, which, for the whale relation, check out our Indohias video. So there's a lot of them, and they've been really, really successful. And even within that, they're specifically within the ruminants, which cuts out a few of those groups like whales, hippos, and camels, but importantly includes a lot of animals with really complex stomachs. And that helps us understand how Xenocaryx would have been living in its environment. Now, the main reason for the ruminant success is in their guts, specifically their foregut, which is kind of a joke, because the foregut is mostly the stomach, but also ruminants have four stomachs. So there's kind of a pun there, and that just means they're really good at digesting some of the plant material that they would be eating. When we think about other animals like horses, they have a large hind gut, and that's where they do most of their digestion. Instead, with ruminants, it happens at the beginning and in the stomach, and that also means there's a little bit more processing. This is because with the four different chambers, the first one is actually the rumen, and that's essentially where the first stage of digestion starts to happen, and a lot of this has actually air in it. And that means a lot of the stuff that's not as chewed by the mouth actually floats to the top and then gets essentially siphoned off into a separate chamber of the stomach. This other part of the stomach is called the reticulum. It's one of those other four chambers of the stomach. And from there, it gets barfed back up into the mouth and they chew it again. This is when people talk about cows chewing their cud. This is what they're doing. They're taking that part that was first in the rumen that didn't get fully digested and broken down. They're sending it to the reticulum and then barfing it back up and chewing it again. After this, it goes through the other two chambers of the stomach, the osmosum and abomasum, which just do more of the more detailed work of actually doing the digestion. Essentially, in the first part, you're trying to break open the cells so you can get those things, and then the later parts of the stomach is where the actual breakdown of what's inside of the cell starts to happen. And this has made the ruminants really, really successful, because as opposed to many other animals, which need to essentially feed constantly in order to have enough food, especially during tougher times of the year, they essentially can just feed for a smaller amount of time and then just spend extra time just resting and processing what they already ate. And that could give them a lot of advantages in certain types of environments. And that holds true for Xenocaryx, where again, this group was found to be pretty successful based on where we found it and its relatives. Xenocaryx specifically has been found in Spain, and in an environment that's from the middle of the Miocene, so about 15 million years ago. And in general, it's thought that this environment had large permanent bodies of water, so either streams or lakes, but also importantly, had a somewhat seasonal climate. So it would have been generally warm, but you'd still have that very distinct season of having wetter and drier seasons, and it would have been hanging around these streams and lakes, eating from a lot of the plants that would have been around. And the thing is, the earliest one found comes from China, and then all the other ones come from Europe. So there's this giant swath of land in Eurasia that we just don't know exactly if there are relatives of Xenocaryx from. I mean, they should be there, we just haven't found any yet. And this is really frustrating, even within going down another group then from just the ruminants to Pecorans. Pecorans are just horn bearers, and you can see that in Xenocaryx. And in fact, the horns actually give it its species name, Amidale, because Amidale is meant to be like Princess Amidala from the Star Wars universe. Because, you know, it's both kind of outrageous uh, headgear that's going on in both those cases. But the thing is, with the other Pecorans, we have a pretty good understanding of their fossil record and where they likely got started. For example, with giraffes, we have things like Brahmatherium, which has been found in India and Turkey, so we have kind of that southwestern portion of Asia as being their likely starting place. Then again, we have things like many kinds of deer that start showing up in Europe, especially the horned deer start showing up in Europe. So it's like, okay, cool, like all of our modern horned deer as opposed to musk deer that have the kind of tusks, those started in Europe. 
There's also the now extinct dromomerosids that show up in North America, so we have a good understanding of where that group shows up and started to evolve from. But for Xenocaryx and its relatives, we don't really have that. And the thing is, a lot of these animals can be really hard to try and define how their relations are because the fossil record is pretty partial. And in fact, even things like pigs or suids, so things like javelina, which aren't technically pigs but are related, we use the same kind of techniques to age them when essentially you find a jawbone of a modern one, you can tell what age it is based on how the teeth are erupting. And you do the same thing with deer with basically the same teeth, because they're really good at chewing food and then processing it. And so those teeth pretty much erupt the same way. So if all you have is jawbones to work with, some of the teeth can be really similar, even across groups that are pretty diversified. Because of this, even some groups like the Dromomeracidae have actually been considered subfamilies of the Paleomeracidae. So some people have said, hey, these are really closely related. And the thing is, it's hard to tell this, but fortunately with Xenocaryx, there's been some new studies done. And this is actually in the paper that described Xenocaryx for the first time. And this paper actually found them to be giraffomorphs. And it's important I say giraffomorphs, not giraffids. So it's not in the same family as giraffes, but they are an offshoot of the lineage that would eventually lead to giraffes. And this makes a lot of sense when you're looking at the horns that are just above the eye, because they have a kind of similar rough texture around the tops, as well as some extra very small projections on these horns. Additionally, they're not quite the same kind of structure, and there's sutures around the bottom that are more similar to giraffes than in dromomerids. So a suture is a very specialized type of joint, and we actually have a lot of them in our skull. So essentially, right here, there's two bones that meet, and they meet in kind of a flat plane. And then there's just a bunch of ligaments joining them, and they don't really shift a lot, which is good when you're looking at trying to build a skull. So we can look at these sutures and where these joints would have been in things like Xenocaryx, Giraffids, and Dromomerids, and be able to understand that, yeah, no, Dromomerids, they didn't have the same kind of structure. They instead seem to have actually fused multiple bones in order to kind of build this horn. Meanwhile, in things like Xenocaryx and the Giraffids, it's a specific bone that just elongated, and you can see that based on the sutures that are around the base of it. So what this means is we kind of think of Xenocaryx and its relatives as being almost like the modern day Okapi, essentially the forest giraffe as many people have called it. It's this kind of strange animal, but it makes sense when you're looking at the Xenocaryx. Based on the somewhat partial fossils we have of them, they may have had a similar posture, kind of sloping upwards and not nearly as dramatic of a neck as modern day giraffes have, but definitely at least leaning towards that kind of posture. And then again, would have been eating from a lot of plants, trees, and then potentially also some of the grasses because they were at least a little closer to the ground. And then because of that, they would have had that four-chambered stomach, been able to process a lot of that and then burp it back up into their mouth, chew it again, and continue processing it until they actually got all of the food that they needed. And it seems also like they built horns in similar ways to modern giraffes. I don't think they necessarily fought the same way that modern giraffes do, using their entire neck to swing it, but it's pretty likely they were fighting with one another. I mean, when we look at all the other Pecorans, the horn bearers, that's pretty much what they do. Even things like Cape Buffalo, we think of them as fighting lions, but mostly those horns are for fighting each other. So all of this leaves us with a kind of deer-like giraffe, which I had really hoped would fit into the holidays better, but it turns out it doesn't because rumen evolution is kind of horse manure. Well, it's not horse manure because horses are another group entirely. It's really more like bull manure. But that's just because we don't really have a great understanding of ruminant evolution right now. And a large part of that is because A, the fossil record is incomplete, we don't have complete fossils for a lot of these animals, but also because once this kind of four-chambered stomach actually evolved, it essentially just took off wildly. And by that I mean this stomach was really, really successful. When it first started to evolve around 30, 35 million years ago, essentially right after that you had this massive burst of diversification where suddenly all of these groups, both the modern and extinct ones, all pretty much show up almost at once. They, they just rapidly evolved and started to fill slightly different niches from one another. And that's somewhat unfortunate, simply because now we really need to try and understand them a little bit better, and that means needing to do more digs, finding more fossils, and trying to see exactly how these groups were related to one another. And again, the fossil record is somewhat incomplete. We don't have complete fossils of many of these animals, but just bits and pieces. And what that really means is we need more people to get out there into the field and start looking at some of these weird mammals. I want to thank the sponsor of this video, Brilliant.org. 
A lot of the fossils that I talked about are coming from Southern Asia and parts of the Middle East. And the thing is, this would be really, really great places to start exploring for these fossils. And a lot of that area has been affected by mountain building. Think of things like the Himalayas. And understanding how that mountain building process takes place requires a lot of physics, something I am not great at. And that's why it's been great to be able to use Brilliant.org and their always updating lessons to try and keep a little bit more refreshed on this than I would otherwise be. Especially since now I'm graduated and out of school, this is a great tool to actually keep a lot of those skills really fresh. So if you're like me and trying to keep some of those earlier lessons a little more up to date in your mind, or if you're learning an entirely new subject, Brilliant.org is the best place online to try and go through a lot of different interactive lessons to try and better understand what the world around you is actually like. The first 200 people to use the link down below get 20% off their annual subscription to their premium service, which is a pretty good deal. Additionally, you can start for free by using that link. So be sure to check out the link down below or go to brilliant.org slash raptorchatter.